Okay, my focus uh, essentially is on the 1997 Declaration on the Human Genome and Human Rights. Um, I'll be using this instrument to talk about different types of binding sources uh, of international law and how one of uh, them is in particular relevance to um, the regulation and governance of uh, new technologies um, and in the context of human reproductive cloning in particular. Uh, so in the process of doing this, I'll look at the role of UNESCO and uh, the United Nations and uh, their contribution to the regulation of human reproductive cloning. Um, I will be stating that while there was a failed attempt at putting together a treaty to prohibit human reproductive cloning, there however exists binding law by way of customary international law that establishes a norm against human reproductive cloning, and I'll trace uh, the origins of this to the 1997 Declaration. Um, and then, of course, uh, we can ask the general question about the relevance of this particular source, yeah, international custom, as a source of law in uh, regulating not just uh, reproductive cloning, but other uh, procedures um, that are part of this uh, growing uh, new biotechnology. So, I start by looking at um, the principles in relation to customary law. Customary law is unwritten international law, and it's based on general and consistent practice of states um, that have accepted them as legally binding. Under Article 38.1 of the Statute of the International Court of Justice, uh, custom is one of the main sources of international law in the resolution of disputes that comes before the International Court of Justice. So this provision is generally accepted as a listing of the sources of international law um, and is regularly quoted in reference um, to what international law is that has been accepted by states. So although it's not listed in any particular order, treaty and custom um, are not really considered you know, better than each other, but almost on par with each other because both are based on consent of states and can also act to nullify each other or supersede each other if there were right conditions, uh, given the right conditions. And there are a number of examples in international law, um, right from the law of the sea, um, for example, the three-mile territorial limit, which changed to 12 miles, um, and that's because of custom, um, rules relating to non-intervention, prohibition of use of force, uh, fisheries, so a number of different areas of international law which have, um, which have been developed because of customary international law, and they're equally binding, and uh, therefore it's a question as to how we could use this particular source of um, uh, uh, international law in the context of regulation of new technologies. Um, now, the conditionality that's attached to the establishment of um, state practice um, comes from rules of consistency. State practice is one of the um, key uh, determiners of whether there's custom or not. Um, although it's unwritten, if there's practice, then that's already the beginning of uh, establishment of custom. Um, statements about state practice are equally uh, considered as important as actual state practice itself because the statements are supposed to be based on what the practice actually is. So this in, in, uh, is, is one part of establishing custom, or in other ways this is the subjective um, part of uh, custom. I'm sorry, this is the objective part of custom. Uh, the subjective part of custom is the belief that such practice is based on um, uh, the, the understanding that uh, such a practice is legal, um, or in other words, it's called opinio juris. So if you want to establish custom in a particular area, you have to identify state practice and opinio juris. Okay, that in short is generally this notion of, um, you know, how custom or custom international law comes about. Now, in the context of human reproductive cloning, uh, the General Assembly Resolution 53-152 of 1998 um, is considered to be an initiator of custom. Yeah. So General Assembly Resolution, and this is General Assembly of the United Nations, adopted by consensus um, and not being voted upon is a strong statement about the rules of conduct of states towards which it is directed. Um, and therefore, uh, General Assembly Resolution, even though is, is of declaratory value, if it is adopted in a particular way and has been followed up, can then become the basis of more binding law. So 
the General Assembly Resolution uh, 53152, entitled Universal Declaration on the Human Genome and Human Rights, is a rule-creating declaration that has been adopted in parts or in whole by various states since its adoption in 1998. And Article 11 of that particular um, declaration states reproductive cloning should be prohibited um, since it is contrary to human dignity. So therein lies the foundation of a binding source of international law, even though the 2005 declaration did not, um, in some ways, uh, state clearly um, that there is a prohibition. And also the 2005 declaration was um, in, you know, supposed to take us towards a treaty. So just because there isn't a treaty that exists in a particular area doesn't mean international law doesn't provide binding, a bindingness, if you like, in that area. I think that's the key point that I want to make here. So that, that, that was one of the main um, themes I wanted to focus on, but I also wanted to uh, quickly touch on one other issue um, in the context of um, the UN, um, in the context of UNESCO, and this is in particular the institutional challenges that we face in regulating uh, biotechnologies. There are a number of them. Um, in the context of UNESCO, uh, you would have heard of the International Bioethics Committee, uh, which was instrumental in producing the 1997 Declaration. This is an innovative independent committee, um, which uh, you know, is tasked with the uh, challenge of looking at how to regulate life sciences. Now, the very nature of this particular body, you know, sitting within an intergovernmental organization, um, sort of having a mandate that has been set by states, um, focused on a lot of the public law issues surrounding biotechnologies. And in that context, it elaborated an instrument which was mainly based on human rights law, um, and to some extent did not address the public-private issues that are now becoming more and more important. And one um, of the issues that I want to flag up here um, is aspects of ownership on the human genome. Um, although um, it was addressed in... Uh, uh, the, 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 the issue of ownership was um, on the agenda to begin with, it slowly receded to the background. However, Articles 1 to 4 in the 1997 Declaration have some very innovative um, concepts about ethical ownership. Yeah. And I'll only refer to, um, um, to that as a gist and uh, talk about the status of heritage of humanity that was bestowed on the human genome through this particular declaration, which has, of course, you know, since um, sort of changed and morphed. Um, so... The main point I want to make in this context of inst institution challenges is that the focus and emphasis on the public law aspects that we are able to discuss within institutions um, in some ways sidelines the private issues which are, I think, in relation to commercialization and ownership that are becoming more and more important at this point. And I'll finish by saying that what we need is uh, multiple coordinates that need to be established for the debate on ownership of human genetic resources, or the human genome, um, the International Bioethics Committee is certainly one of them, but also trade forums um, are definitely um, another of them. So I think I'll stop there.